We're here at the Bargello, and today we're going to be talking about a really influential man of the Renaissance period, and this man is Donatello. Yes, Donatello was a very important man, extremely important, and someone who, frankly, doesn't get the credit he deserves. I feel as though he's pioneered a lot of what we know as the early Renaissance. Now, Donatello was known as such, known as Donatello, but his real name was Donato di Niccolo di Perpetuo Bardi. Donatello was actually a nickname commonly given to those with the same name born in his time period. It was, actually. It's pretty similar to nicknames like Tommy or Andy. Donatello was a diminutive form of his birth name. It's interesting, really, that we speak of him by his nickname. We don't usually see that in other artists. Hmm. Donatello was born in Florence in the year 1386. As we know, the Renaissance was barely starting around this period. Gothic ideals were only just beginning to fade out. So by the time Donatello had begun to expand on his art career, the Renaissance was in its early stages. It's really because of this that Donatello is very rarely compounded with the greats like da Vinci or Michelangelo. He wasn't a part of the grandiose picture that was the high Renaissance. He was more of a background man. Something unfortunate, actually. He tends to be forgotten, ignored even, in most representations of the Renaissance period. Well, this was certainly in part due to his own pieces, the fact that he didn't quite represent the Renaissance period, but rather he represented the new, budding ideas that were just starting to emerge. In the Renaissance, there was a huge humanist movement taking place where people were shifting away from these past spiritual ideas of the Middle Ages and bringing focus back to the natural human form. That's right. The Middle Ages outright rejected the concept of the perfect human, of representing this ideal man, because of the fear that people would regard these realistic figures as idols and stray from God, something that the Church obviously did not want. Exactly. But after centuries of this clear separation between pagan perfectionism and Christian spirituality, artists of the period had begun to blur the lines and start rendering more realistic figures and forms. Yes, and in fact, when Donatello first started his artistic career, he followed a more gothic style, shown in his first David sculpture, where David's form is clothed and his features are simplified and elongated. This David was actually the first David he made, but not the David we will be talking about today. No, of course not because this David clearly does not show any Renaissance ideals. The David that we're going to be focused on is one that really reflects a huge shift in the age of the Renaissance, one that reflects Donatello's new vision of this biblical scene. Yes, and it can be said that this is his most famous work, the one that he's most known for, the Bronze David. First thing we have to take note of is it is plain fact that it is made of bronze. This and in and of itself is an extremely important change in the way things were done. Bronze castings had not been seen since the classical Greece age. So to make a bronze David was such a bold way of going back to the old ideas. This is also seen in the fact that this David stands completely nude. It's a nude figure. Before this time, nearly all depictions of the human body after antiquity were fully clothed. Any figure shown in the nude was meant to sometimes be a symbol of innocence, but usually they were shown to be bad, symbols of carnal sin. Yes, but here we have a nude David, a biblical figure that is inherently good. He has no connections to the sinful. In fact, he is meant to conquer the sinful. He is, and that's what gives Donatello's David such an interesting power. It's turning something old into something new, and that something old is classical Greco-Roman ideals. Yes. Here we're going back to the antiquity, embracing the ideas of the beauty of the human form that were once widely rejected in the art of the Middle Ages. Yes, but even so, you can tell Donatello puts his own spin on it. He doesn't quite follow these ideals to the letter. Look at the way David is posed. Look at the way his leg is, the way that his shoulders are bent, even the way that his head is going. You know, he's not quite in contrapposto, but rather in a more exaggerated version of this classical pose. His hand is on his hip, not raised. His head isn't tilted quite enough to give that that contrapposto balance. Even his physical state, look at his arms. Compared to classical statuary, he's ridiculously lean to the point where the sword looks awfully large compared to this, this child. It's nothing like the athletic beauty that we've seen in classical Greco Roman sculpture. Then again, it's commonly thought that this is the intended effect, that it's meant to show just how young and vulnerable David actually was at the time he slayed Goliath, as opposed to other interpretations of a sort of a more regal David who would soon to be king. Yes, and this can even be seen in the size of the piece itself. This David is a life-size sculpture. It's not any bigger than a common person. 
And yet, this David was meant to be placed on a pedestal in the center of a courtyard. It was meant to be placed so that the audience had to view it from below. It's a funny balance of humility and reality to show that David was a grand figure, and yet, just as a human as the rest of us. Yes, and that was another new idea of the Renaissance, of showing holy figures as human. In the Middle Ages, it was the spirituality of the holy figure that was the most important. So there was almost no effort put into making their forms realistic. They were just meant to be images to represent this figure and what they were. But here, David's vulnerable humanity is fantastically portrayed. It is the most important part of this piece. I imagine it's for good reason. The story of David and Goliath is meant to show how in Christian belief, God can prevail in any battle, even one between a young boy and a seasoned giant. Indeed, the story revolves around this triumphant victory despite all odds, one that reflects the victory of Florence over Milan when Italy was shattered into republics at the time. It's very comparable to this grand biblical story as we can see here. Once upon a time, many, many years ago, the Philistines came to Judah to make war with Israel. They drew up their battle lines in the low plain of Elah, Israelites on one side of the valley, the Philistines on the other. For 40 days they stood ready for battle. For 40 days the Philistine champion Goliath taunted them, a giant of a man, nine feet tall. Here comes Goliath. Ah! Why do you cards draw up in battle formation? myself torn the battle lines of Israel this day. Give me a man and let us fight together. King Saul and the Israelite army were greatly afraid of Goliath. There was a young shepherd called David who loved Jehovah very much. Take this bread to your brothers in Saul's army and see that they're okay. Come on, bring your best man to me now. Soldier, I'm King Saul. How can I help you? David wants to kill Goliath. You can't fight this Philistine, you're just a boy. And he's been a soldier all his life. I kill a bear. Hmm. I got no help. Go! <laughs> Come on, I kill all of you! <laughs> that you're coming to me with a stick. He has a sword, but I has a hyper. Just come to me and I will give your body to the birds and animals to eat. Take your hands off!
With the backing of Jehovah, Saul's army would go on to defeat the Philistines. David would become king of Israel. Truly a beautiful story. Yes, I'm really touched. However, despite the many older themes we return to, Donatello's David still has many elements that, in that time, were considered modern. Take, for example, David's hat. Yes, this feathered hat is nothing like what a young Jewish soldier would wear at that time. In fact, these hats are more reminiscent of a Florentine headpiece that they would have used. That's what makes art historians so sure that this piece was meant to commemorate the defeat of the Duke of Milan, because this David wore what was, at the time, a symbol of their heritage. Certainly. Even the youthful appearance of David that we had touched upon earlier reflects the city's young and blooming nature, but this David is really shown to be the representative of Florence. There is a theory that the Medici family had commissioned the sculpture almost as a donation to the city, but no one can really be sure. Not many records remain of the bronze David's true backstory. It can be easily assumed that the Medici family commissioned such a piece, after all they're most famous for being one of the major paintings of art in the Renaissance. But we can't be sure. No, we can't. And it's a shame, really. Not much is known about Donatello's work as a whole, and not just his David. Now, I think it would only be appropriate to finish this analysis of Donatello by examining the progression of his work. I agree completely. David is just one of many works that highlight Donatello's contributions to the Renaissance as one of the first to stray from Gothic ideals of the Dark Ages. Yes, that's true, as here we have a statue of St. Mark, one of Donatello's earlier works. Here you can see he's reliant on the traditional Greek canon. There's that beloved contrapposto and the use of drapery to maintain modesty, while trying to accent the outline of his figure. You do, however, start to see his emphasis on hyper-realistic details in small veins and the drapery that is indicative of not only the Renaissance, but Donatello as his own artist. That's very true. A Donatello piece can be identified by his attention to naturalism and to detail. Rarely, if ever, will a Donatello piece glorify a figure. He emphasizes realism in all his works. Also, the subject matter is almost always a religious figure, either commissioned by the church or just a personal favorite of Donatello. Very true. The only thing that changes with Donatello would be his medium. He has experimented with many different types. Here is another prime example of this. Ah, here we have my personal favorite artwork from Donatello, Magdalene Penitent. Really? Why is that? Well, so often a piece can strike you as beautiful or enchanting, but this one is just downright creepy. I see what you mean, but this is a common pose for Mary Magdalene to be in. Very true, but the emaciation of her body and battered state is what sets Donatello's apart and made it so iconic, not only to me, but society as well. I think, in addition to David, it captures the essence of Donatello. He takes something traditional, like a biblical figure or a Greek canon, and manipulates it to make it work with his own style. A very detailed, realistic, and sometimes a bit weird style. Indeed. He really was such an influence on the High Renaissance, and yet, when you think about it, He'd only really made three big statues of note before his death in 1466. Even that is shrouded in a lot of mystery. No one really knows what he died from. Even though there's not enough coverage on Donatello, we have to admit he made a huge mark on the period of the Renaissance. Of course, Donatello was a man of breaking conventions, breaking from tradition, and that was really what the Renaissance was all about, breaking tradition. And yet... At the same time, he was reintroducing tradition to a world that had lost it. From his method of bronze casting to the whole idea of humanism, Donatello looked back to Greco-Roman ideas to go forward into the Renaissance. Yes, and that's why we truly can consider him a pioneer of the early Renaissance, as the man who set the standard for the future revolution ahead of him.